All right, let's start it. Hi, my name is Mike Simon. I am a legal technology consultant. I'm also an adjunct professor at Michigan State. And in between that, I go around giving talks about the future of the law. And when people talk about the future of the law, the experts tend to divide into one of two camps. Let's see if the auto advance here works on the map. Does it work? It's not working. <laughs> you know, just give me this and I'll help you. Yes, they divide into one of two camps. They look at this and they say either machines are going to do all of our hard work and make us such better lawyers, or robots will steal our jobs. But you see, they're kind of both right and they're kind of both wrong. Because the answer actually is, it's both. You see, robots don't want to steal our jobs. They don't want our jobs. They don't want anything. They're robots. It's people who want things. And when it's people who want things, we talk about economics. And economics, we see increasingly concentrating wealth and success at the top. It's a power law curve. You got the haves and the have-nots. And the distance keeps getting farther. And so we see this. You know, we hear about this, this quote all the time. It's almost a cliche. Most of us take it as a, you know, a go-to thing, a charge, a call to action, be the change. But you know what, I see it much more as kind of a warning that things aren't going to change, that this equality is just, even inequality is going to get worse. So we look at in the law, here's just one example. We see starting salaries for new lawyers. Looks like a random distribution, right around $60,000. When we look at the whole chart, we realize, yeah, this is actually a power law curve. This is a bunch of folks making two to three times what their cohorts make, a small group. And so, you know, this is a big issue. This is something actually I've got coming up in a law journal article coming out this fall. I've got a couple of great co-authors. And uh, to make an 80-page long story short, we focus on a new case from the Second Circuit, David Lola versus Skadden, where the Second Circuit had to decide whether what an e-discovery contract review attorney, pressing on documents, yes, no, relevant, not, whether that was the practice of law. Sorry, I'm only one half of your quotes. Um, and what they decided, sua sponte, shockingly, was that if robots can do it, if computers can do it, it cannot, as a matter of law, be the practice of law, period. And so others who look at this, Dan Katz, who's a legal futurist, law professor, sees this current situation as something where a lot of us are going to need to change, to become something else to survive. And what does he suggest? He suggests that a bunch of us become these legal technologists, or technologists who work with the law. This is a great thing. I think this is a very cool idea. We're all going to become coders, because you know coding's fun. My daughter does that. She's 11. They have the hour of code. Hey, you know, we'll all become programmers. But there's only one slight problem. Coding is not actually easy, and it's not always fun, and some of us have really bad math skills. Some of us, me included, are history majors. And you know what they say about our history majors? Oh, it doesn't even sound, there's no video. Ruin. This is actually Barack Obama dissing our history majors on video, which apparently isn't going to come out on the sound. Oh, well, you'll have to catch me later. I'll send it to you as part of the intro. So the result is, you know, for most of us, remaining within the law is probably where we're headed. And the difference between those who are going to be at the top of the power law curve and happy, and those who are going to be at the bottom, is probably more about how we use technology, how we understand technology. And let's be clear about the importance of this. Because if you're down here where Dan leaves out those folks, you know, you're probably headed for a pretty bad situation. So at this point, the question is, look, you know, I'm not here to tell you bad news. You didn't come here to hear that. And I'm certainly not going to be the one who tells you, you know, we all have to go welcome our new computer overlords. You're not going to be working for robots. You're going to be doing as lawyers what you've already done, but doing it in a way that you help them understand the risks and the benefits of technology. And so here's just one example I got. We'll, we'll stop the pretty pictures for a minute. I was at an event a couple weeks ago at the ABA, and there was a woman on stage, young lawyer for a big bank on a panel, talking about how one of the regulators for the bank was concerned that some of the credit determination codes, algorithms, were discriminatory. They got an inquiry. So she went to her IT people and asked them, hey, can you tell me how this works? We've got to test it. 
what did they do? They handed her the code and said, just go read it. Just read it all. You'll figure it out. And she pushed back and said, you know what? I can't read this. I'm not a programmer. So she worked with them. They tested it. And they worked it out in a way that they all worked together as a team to do this, to make it happen, to get rid of that inquiry, and make sure that their code was not discriminating. And in the end, that's what this is about. It's not about you're going to work with robots. It's you're going to continue to work with your clients and provide that services, provide it in a way that helps them understand and mitigate the risk of technology. There you go. Yeah. All right, um, where's the uh, slide changer? Mayor, do a slide changer. All right, so I'm back. A uh, little bit different area of conversation. Um, I'm going to talk to you about millennials and kind of try and lift the veil and dispel or confirm some stereotypes that there are about us because. Um, whether you like it or not, millennials are probably going to ask the question, do I really need a lawyer? Um, this is because you can either call us you know, cheap and lazy or you know, shrewd and thrifty, but the reality is we're going to find a path of least resistance to solving a problem, and when it comes to service providers, it's usually going to be the cheapest solution. <laughs> so millennial is anyone who's born between 1980 and 2000, and they are the biggest generation in U.S. history. We've been categorized as impatient, narcissistic, lazy, indecisive, the Peter Pan generation because we won't grow up. And yeah, you know, some of that's true, but you know, to that I don't really have any reaction because we are going to be the predominant workforce within the next couple of years. So we have lower employment levels, smaller incomes, and less money than previous generations. But we want more choices personalization and customization of the products and services we buy, and authentic interaction with the brands and service providers that we choose. So you might be thinking, why bother dealing with millennials? Well, as I mentioned, there's a lot of us. We represent over a quarter of the entire population and have over $200 billion a year in spending power. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be 75% of the workforce by the year 2030. So now you know why, uh, the question becomes how to reach and interact millennials, specifically when it comes to the law. I think it would be helpful to go over some key behaviors that drive our purchasing decisions. The first is that we are not swayed by particular um, traditional advertising. So in a survey, 1% of millennials said that an ad would change how much they trust a particular brand or service providers. As millennials, we tend to trust our friends, our social networks, and blogs more than traditional advertising. So that means that lawyers and service providers have to begin to build authentic and trusting relationships with millennials. Um, and we're also digital native, which is a word everyone throws around. Essentially, it just means that millennials grew up with technology in the home, which everyone knows. Um, but it also means that millennials are used to solving all of their problems with tech, which can create a problem for lawyers because legal profession is one of the oldest professions there is, and the laws were written hundreds of years ago. So you have to be able to embrace new technologies and new ways that millennials will be trying to solve their legal problems. Otherwise, you will be left behind. Another problem is that we're set in our ways. Um, Accenture estimates that $30 billion will change hands from baby boomers to the millennials in the coming years. But 57% of millennials surveyed said that that would not change their uh, consumer habits. It's not all bad news, though, because we tend to be very brand loyal. As you can see there, 60% often are always are loyal to the brands you currently purchase. And this presents an interesting opportunity. This means that if you can reach a millennial customer at the time that they first need the service, you have most likely created a client who will be faithful to you for the next several years. Um, so if you can establish a relationship and provide value at the point, the price point that is palatable to a, a millennial, it will pay off down the road. And we've seen this in the auto industry. Millennials with their starter cars will buy a Honda, a Hyundai, a Ford, 
and once they have the means, they will want to upgrade. And since they were having positive brand experiences with these brands, they will buy a higher price for Honda or Hyundai. That is why Mercedes-Benz has launched a $35,000 C-Class because they see this happening and they want to move down market so they can capture some of these millennials and then when the millennials are ready for an upgrade, they can pay full price for an E-Class or you know, a G-Wagon or whatever they want. So lawyers need to embrace the fact that millennials will ask this question and instead of just saying yes, obviously, as we just heard in the last presentation, you need to embrace the new platforms and tools and at the very least have an understanding because a millennial will find out about an easier or cheaper way to do something no matter what you put in front of them. Be authentic and build trust. So providing value at the point where the millennial is at and establishing a relationship by providing that value to them either at little or no cost. And it's going to hurt up front, but I promise you it will pay off down the road. Hi. Thanks Hello. everybody for being here. I'm Lynn Kelmy. I'm the head of customer success at Shoebox. Um, I also like to describe myself as a recovered lawyer. Um, that means I started out my career as a typical corporate lawyer in a big firm. It was 2006, and that's what everyone told us we had to do. Uh, I did typical corporate lawyer things, venture deals, company formations, etc. until a few years later when something really awesome happened. I got laid off. In 2008, 2009, when the market crashed, about 15,000 of us big firm lawyers were laid off, and I was one of them. The reason I think that's an awesome thing to have happened is that had I not been laid off, I still would have been toiling away in a big firm, not available to join a company called Brightleaf, uh, which actually one of my former colleagues is here this evening. Um, Brightleaf was making document automation for lawyers, which enabled me to get a first-hand look at how law firms, particularly those serving emerging companies, uh, were working with those clients and how tricky those relationships were, uh, how difficult it was economically for those firms to serve those clients, those clients' needs were very tricky for the law firms to address, etc. And what I've really learned along the way, now that I have spent more time being a corporate lawyer for startups, and even more time doing client service and marketing and business development for a law firm that focused on the startup market, is that most lawyers have absolutely no idea why their clients are hiring them and why they're continuing to work with them or not. So let's talk a little bit about why lawyers get hired. Um, Historically, I think we as a profession have done a really bad job of understanding what's going on here. A lot of us lawyers think, oh, I am getting hired because I'm an expert in my field. You can look at literally any law firm website and it says the exact same thing. Jane Smith is a wonderful lawyer. She's a great corporate lawyer. She's done 18,000 transactions. She is the most experienced person in this field. That's actually not why most legal service purchasing decisions get made. So over here, this top 15%, yes, that's how they get made. But that, those purchases are focused on bet the company litigation, SEC inquiries, things that are incredibly complex and carry a high degree of risk for the individual or business at hand. The far side, the other 15%, there you're looking at things that are so simple that cost becomes the driving factor in that purchasing decision. So I think about those as the lawyer who helped me buy my house. Right? These are not complicated things. In the middle, 70% of legal purchasing decisions are made based on a relationship. So a potential client knows a lawyer, feels comfortable, feels that they are sufficiently qualified to do the work, and that their cost is not so far out of line with what is reasonable for that market, for that work, that that person is acceptable. But the driving force is the relationship. In fact, people will pay more to work with a lawyer that they know and that they trust. So what lawyers have done with this, all of this information about their clients and how they buy things, is they've tried to make themselves really, really popular, really, really well liked by their, their clients. And you all know how this works. I totally played this game. It's ball games, it's dinners, it's super fast delivery of actual documents and work. 
It's responses to emails at all hours of the day or night within an hour. Um, we've all seen those above the law articles where the memos go out and they say you need to respond within two hours at this time and all of those things. Lawyers call this relationship building. The problem is these aren't actually relationships because every bit of energy is going in one direction. And if you think about your relationship with your friends, your spouse, your parents, your kids, relationships are a two-way street. So if we as lawyers want to say that we are using relationship selling, if our relationships are building the services that we practice in, we have to build more reciprocal relationships with our clients. I like to think of this as lawyers acting like a guy who's buying flowers over and over for his girlfriend, and then she's forgetting his birthday. This is what this looks like. I joke about this, but really, the way that lawyers have constructed their relationships with their clients, it requires no involvement from the actual client. There's no way for lawyers to gauge how happy that client is, how much they value the lawyer's services, how much they feel like they are getting what they need from that lawyer. We've all seen there are consulting firms that go out and get this information from clients and then feed it back to the law firms. Um, that's, you know, seems like a very expensive proposition. So how can, I realize I'm totally going over. Um, in my eyes, the next frontier of client service is engagement, right? Getting and keeping someone's attention, which if lawyers are being savvy about how their clients want to interact with them, as Bennett sort of set up for us, it's going to be driven by technology. This is, of course, a friendly audience, and people realize this. Clients of these law firms are already using technology to run their businesses, right? We're all using Google Docs, WordPress, Salesforce, etc. These are all commonplace. If lawyers truly want to engage their clients in systems that are collaborative, that allow their clients to have engagement with the processes that the lawyer is completing, they will adopt things like transparent billing systems. So how much have you spent on that project? Who's working on it? Um, how deep into your budget are you? Project management tools, what's done, what's not done? Who is working on it? Instant messaging, talk to your clients in a time frame and in a way that they want to engage with you. And collaboration on documents and workflows. Let the lawyers contribute the high value work, let the clients come in and contribute the information that they want and have ownership and control over the way that their businesses are run. I think as we sort of continue into um, an environment with law firms where technology is more comfortable and more adopted by more lawyers, we're going to see a lot more of these tools be used, hopefully sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Chris Combs, uh, co-founder of the Link Squares. And the title of my talk is Legal Debt, Why Companies Should Move to a Digital Contract Process. So what is legal debt? It's actually a phrase that we coined at Link Squares when talking with our customers. Um, it's described as risks and other problems created by businesses using archaic processes for important agreements and contracts that make them difficult to track and review. We find that seven out of 10 companies have this problem. So what's the major culprit of this? It's actually scan PDFs. Scan PDFs are essentially text documents that are locked as an image. Basically, once they're scanned, um, it's difficult to convert them out of anything that they're already in. So you already have, you have this problem where you have a text document that's no longer a text document. The other problem is that continued use of those creates more and more debt. So you can imagine as companies take on more and more scanned PDFs, they have more and more trouble gathering information inside them, and then also taking on the act of converting them away from that uh, creates bigger and bigger problems. So what, could, what can a company that's using scan PDFs or has a lot of scan PDFs do about it? We recommend a couple things. First is to find and gather your scan PDFs and get them in one location. We run across a lot of situations where companies have documents in multiple places and it makes it really difficult to find what they need when they're looking for it if you have three or four different locations that your team is putting documents. 
The other thing you can look at is actually converting those documents uh, back to a text-based format uh, using OCR technology and a combination of services. The last thing is whether or not you decide to convert those documents in your backlog um, to a, at least adopt a digital process moving forward. I'll get to more on that in just a second. So if you're considering taking on uh, this OCR conversion process, there's a couple things that we always recommend. One is just assessing the material and making sure there's no special tables or characters that you have to look at that could create a problem for the OCR technology. The other piece is creating a workflow and a plan that involves quality assurance. And the reason I say quality assurance is because OCR technology commonly makes mistakes. Uh, it's about 95% accurate when it's converting these documents. One of those examples is uh, it takes the letter M and it actually turns it into two N's. So you can imagine that those characters look the same for the technology. Um, so it, it, it commonly makes mistakes. I have a whole list of them that uh, you can ask me about later that, uh, that OCR technology makes. The last thing I would say is consider actually outsourcing the project to someone who has some experience. You can find folks on Upwork and other places that have a lot of experience with this. It's actually a service that we provide uh, to our clients as well. So whether or not you actually take on the task of converting those via OCR uh, technology, um, we do recommend uh, moving forward with a digital process. And the first piece of that is actually adopting a digital e-signature tool, like DocuSign or Adobe Sign. Uh, the reason that we recommend doing that is because those documents that get signed in that aren't scanned, and they actually come away as a digital document. So utilizing the e-signature tool keeps you out of this issue of what do you do with all your scanned PDFs. The other thing that we recommend is not to just buy it. We run across a lot of companies that uh, buy it and then uh, don't make it part of their process or don't mandate that folks use it. And, and it's just as good as sitting on the shelf at that point. So sticking to it and making sure that uh, any vendors or other com uh, customers that you're potentially working with, uh, that they're actually um, adhering to this process and that that's reducing the number of scanned PDFs that you're dealing with. The, other, the, the last thing is uh, moving to a cloud-based storage system away from a shared drive. Um, this creates a lot more flexibility with your files so you can take advantage of the APIs that products like Google Docs, Dropbox, Box offer uh, and utilize those tools. So that's it. Um, we're actually launching a, a free ebook uh, that talks about all this in a lot more detail. My email is right at the bottom there, so uh, if anybody's interested in uh, the free ebook, um, feel free to give me a shout. Thank you. So I actually probably should have maybe gone before I went. I might have been a good precursor too, but that's okay. Uh, so my name is Mike. I'm a little top on who designed the ebook today. <coughs> Uh, just a quick background, uh, working on a company called Foundation Lab right now. I'm a bar attorney in the state of Massachusetts and an uh, entrepreneur. Uh, I also teach a class on rapid prototyping and experimentation at Suffolk Business School. So, as we know, uh, the law is an institution as old as time. Uh, old books, buildings, uh, that's sort of the perception of, of the law. This is actually our Supreme Court. Uh, if you dirtied it up a little bit, it probably was 2,000 years old. This actually was built 80 years ago. Um, I think that is, has to do with the concept called precedent. I'm blaming this on precedent. Uh, the concept of, as we're, as we're taught in law school, of looking backwards at decisions that have been made to help shape the choices that we make today. Uh, I think that's bled into the way that we've designed legal services instead of looking at what people need. We look at what other law firms and lawyers and, and how they've designed uh, the way that they deliver their services. Uh, I pulled a few friends to ask, and again, these are startup people, so that might be why these answers came up. Uh, about their last legal experience, I asked them to describe in one word. Uh, this is what we came up with. So, by looking at historical data of what law firms have done and using that to design legal services, we've created a slow and clunky system uh, that is also opaque, so not ideal. So, what if we started over? How might we do that? How might we redesign 
uh, the legal experience to be more friendly to our clients. Uh, I don't really have an answer for what it would look like. I know some of you folks might have uh, a better perception or idea for, for what that could be and, and through tools that you guys are building, we might get there. Uh, but what I do is a framework for trying to arrive at what these solutions could be. Uh, and that framework is human-centered design. Uh, I don't know how many people have heard of this, but uh, it's pretty common these days to sign thinking human-centered design. Um, but it's a pretty simple process. It's, uh, I'm gonna read this because I think it's simple, but uh, really gets the, the point across. So it's a process that starts with the people you're designing for and ends with new solutions that are tailor-made to suit their needs. Uh, IDEO is a company that designed the Apple Mouse and uh, they use human-centered design to create all the products that they have. Um, so this is one of the many uh, processes or frameworks. Uh, again, there are variations of this, but this is probably the most commonly used. Uh, it begins with empathy, uh, starting with your user. Who is your user? In our case, it would be uh, legal clients. Uh, the next step is define, so define the problem that you're solving. Uh, there are many, uh, and it's important to have one that you're really focused on. Uh, the next step is ideate, this is brainstorming. There are no bad ideas in this stage, just get everything out there that you can. Uh, and what follows that is prototyping. And prototyping can be anything, sketching, uh, coming up with a cardboard model. But the goal is really to arrive at testing where you're able to observe behavior and learn. It's not uh, about finding the right solution, but it's about testing uh, and learning from the ones that you are able to put out, put out there. And it's almost a uh, process of elimination to anyway. But again, that may be a long framework. Uh, it's gonna take some practice to learn. Uh, but it really begins with empathy and again in our situation we're talking about legal services and touched on it it's clients how do you think about your relationship with clients and what do they need from you uh, clients come in all different shapes and sizes um, and their needs differ dramatically so think about what their specific needs are and design from that instead of looking at what other law firms have done other lawyers think about what they're what these people need now um, so this has been pretty high level uh, I think we can jump into just a quick little example. It's actually probably a little bit similar to what them went over, but let's say you represent startups. Um, there are thousands of them, uh, and they are different than a corporation. So how do they differ? How do their needs differ? Um, let's start quickly with how they do work. This is a photograph of uh, Mass Challenge. I don't know if some of you recognize it, but uh, it's an open space that houses dozens of startups. So right off the bat, you can see some of the constraints of this working environment, right? A little bit difficult to go jump on a phone call with an attorney. Uh, meeting rooms are at a premium. So how do you take those constraints and turn them into a way to accommodate your clients instead of making it more difficult? Well, it's pretty simple. Without building anything, you can just link into it. We've discussed this ways to uh, link into the way that they already work. So instead of jumping on phone calls, uh, why don't you use Google Drive to, or why don't you jump on Slack or uh, use Google Hangouts to have a conversation or Skype. So you can take it even further and you can fully integrate with what your startup clients are using. Uh, use project management tools like Asana to assign tasks that you need them to do. Um, you can use Calendly to schedule things quickly. I know both lawyers and startups are busy, so use that. Uh, the other option is building something of your own. Uh, some of the things that Ben talked about, so messaging, uh, assigning tasks, sharing documents, keeping up to data matters. But uh, again, Human-centered design, uh, it's a way for you to, instead of looking at the past, look at the present, examine it deeply, and use your understanding to create the future. Uh, 